Amen. We are a week away from Resurrection Sunday. And um, I'm excited of what God wants to do in us and what he wants to do through us. And so uh, come next week with a great level of expectation because God is up to something. When, 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 when Tammy and I first got married, uh, we, how we got married yet? Mm -hmm. We was married. We used to go down to this place in Dallas uh, called Royal Lane. And anybody who ever lived in Dallas and know anything about Royal Lane, they got all these little um, uh, shops where you can buy stuff. Uh, it's supposed to be name brand stuff, but it's real cheap, if you know what I'm saying. <laughs> so uh, my, I think back then, Tommy Hill figure was a big brand, and uh, I, I think that's all I wanted, well, know nothing else. And so we go into this little shop, and we going to get, get me some clothes, because I didn't have much clothes. And there was a sign over the stuff that said, uh, do not unfold clothes. Big sign, you can see it. Don't unfold the clothes. You can buy them, but you can't check them out. And so, man, I saw my size and I was excited. Man, this is Tommy here figure for four dollars. Offered to get fifteen of these. And so we got them home. They bagged them up. We got them home, and uh, I took one of the shirts out of the bag, JD. And this collar was real long, and this collar was real short. <laughs> I got another shirt, the neck wouldn't open. And one of them, the sleeve was, you know, different color than. Needless to say, every, I think, I, I think of, of 10 shirts, I may have had one wear Bruce shirt. So for the most part, they were all flawed. It was something wrong with them. They were not as advertised, but they were highly flawed. And I say that to say, when I'm, when I'm thinking about how they put Jesus to death, um, the whole thing was flawed. But I want us to think on these times. Thank God for flaws. Mm. Because in my life, it's, it's been the flaws that have made me push to be better. For, for instance, one of my, one of my, one of the flaws in my character is I'm real impatient. And I have to pray for patience. And, and it seems like the more I pray for patience, the more I get stuck in traffic. <laughs> and the more I get stuck in traffic, the more I beat on my horn. And the more I beat on my horn, the worse traffic gets. But I'm praying for patience. So it seems like the flaws, our personal flaws, always push us to be better if you want to address them if you want to be better so so thank God for flaws and so what I wanted to do is just walk through um, the trial of Jesus um, and it's been a lot of debate we didn't have time to get into today but did Jesus die on a Thursday or was it a Friday because if it was a Friday he couldn't have stayed in the grave for three nights that's that's a discussion for that's a great Bible study so we'll do that one day but 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 thank God for Friday's flaw because there was a whole lot of things that were flawed in the way that Jesus was crucified. First off, when you get to the garden, um, it's probably about 11.30 or 12 o'clock at night, maybe later, earlier in the morning. And Jesus, y'all know, Jesus said, hey, y'all stay here and I'm going to go over here and pray. Now don't go to sleep. Stay awake and pray. So it was a few of them. And so, of course, we know they couldn't stay awake. But, but here comes Judas. And the Bible says that Judas had some armed men with him. They had swords and they had some clubs while Jesus was over there playing. And it was night, so they had the torches. And the reason why G Judas had to kiss Jesus is because it's dark. And they could have easily made a mistake and grabbed the wrong guy. So Judas said, I'll kiss Jesus. Now, mind you, Jesus has every day been teaching in the temple. They knew what Jesus looked like, but we want to make sure we get Jesus. We don't want to get nobody else. And so, so they go into the garden with armed soldiers. Judas, Jesus' inner circle, has armed soldiers with him as he goes to betray him. So he kisses Jesus. 
And I love the way that, that Jesus responds um, because he didn't run. Think about this now. You're the son of God. You know that the hour has come. I'm fixing to face a horrific death. If it was Ronald Moore, best believe that every ounce of speed I got at 33 years old, they finna see it. And they can't kill. They armored up. So chances are they ain't gonna see me. And they got no torches. I can run off in the dark. And I can hide behind a tree. And then, so Jesus didn't run. He didn't fight back. Now, now he could have had his thug partner, Peter, come and put in work. Because y'all know Peter's sword that he chopped off the, deer, the dude's ear with. Think about this now. Peter's a fisherman. And the reason why he carried a sword, I got to show you this. The reason why he carried a sword is because as we're pulling the nets up, and there's maybe an alligator in the nets. Uh, he didn't even get my fish. So, think about this. He wasn't trying to chop the dude's ear off. He was trying to chop his head off. <laughs> Think about it. Now, why in the world would he pull his sword to chop off somebody's ear that's attacking his partner? Hmm? He was trying to take his head off. So other than Peter, wasn't no fight. So Jesus said, chill out, Peter. Put the dude's ear back on. And so Jesus asked him this question. He says, am I like a, a terrorist or an international criminal that you got to bring soldiers with swords and clubs to get me? I said, well, I guess uh, you something because you got to die tonight, Jack. That's all we know. And but Jesus was trying to let him know that, look, I know what y'all are doing. And the whole thing about it was the whole thing was flawed because if you know anything about the Jewish law at this time, and, and we'll get into it here in a minute, is that um, the Jewish law said that you couldn't arrest somebody at night. It had to be during the daytime. But here they come because they were so desperate. You have to be awfully desperate and intimidated or, or scared of somebody. One man to go against all the things, the customs and the traditions and the laws that were established to make sure that you get him. So they get Jesus and they, they take him to trial. And one of the things that we have to know is that um, for, for, for during this time, the Sanhedrin Council, which was comprised of Pharisees, Sadducees, and the high priests. They were, they were the ruling authority. They would be like our government today. And so they were the one over the Jewish nation. They're the one that, um, that you had to go in front of if you had a case that you wanted to put somebody to death, if you had that kind of a case. And so they, they get them together at 1 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> which was against the law, against customs. That was, that was flawed because it had to be in the daytime. See, they thought that the reason why we want to make sure that we do trials in the daytime is because we want to be transparent. We want to make sure that people see that we're carrying out justice the right way. And we don't want it to be no question about our godly representation of how we rule the people. So we will not have trials at night. We will not arrest somebody at night. We will not hand out any punishments or convictions at night. Everything will be in the daytime in plain sight for people to see because we represent God. And so it was against their laws and their traditions to sneak in at night and to arrest somebody and drag them through two and a half, three hours worth of trials just because they wanted him to die. So here they are, they, they, the, the, the Supreme Court of that day, um, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the priests, they all were supposed to represent the sovereignty of God. They met during the day. They arrest Jesus in the morning. And the flaw, um, another flaw was, if Hagen and I are partners in crime, in this day, he can't testify against me in a capital case or in a, in, a, in a case that could potentially end in my death because we partners. He has a reason to lie on me. Why? To save his own neck. Because um, if you caught me and he's my partner, who's just as guilty as me? 
He is. So why would I trust the word of somebody who's just as guilty as me to put me to death? That, that the law said you can't do that. So here it is. Judas is in the inner circle with Jesus. Been traveling with him the whole time. Been, you know, keeping the money and going around preaching about the Messiah. And, and they're going to go get Judas to be the testifier or the witness against Jesus. Well, again, uh, according to their law, you should, we weren't supposed to be able to do that. Because Judas is just as guilty as me because we're partners. He's in my inner circle. So that was a flaw. Judas testifying against Jesus. Yep, that's him right there. That was a flaw. And then so after they arrest him, it gets worse, y'all. It gets worse. And you got, you got to read this. And the, the children's Bible is a great way to read it because you, you'll start laughing about some of the stuff that they did once you understand the customs of that day. So they arrest Jesus. They tie him up. And then they take him to Ananias. Now, here's the thing about Ananias. Ananias had no legal authority over anybody at this point in time. Why? You might ask, thank you, I'll tell you. Now, he was a former high priest, but Ananias was retired now. Now, I remind you, it's 1 or 30, 2 o'clock in the morning, and they take him to a retired high priest. Not somebody that's a part of the ruling council, but some dude that's retired, on his farm, fishing, you know, raising cows, hanging out, not doing anything, but he didn't like Jesus. So they take him over here. And the reason why he didn't like Jesus that y'all remember uh, on Palm Sunday when Jesus came right into town, he went to the temple and they were selling things in the temple. And Jesus said, not in my father's house. And you know, he turned over the tables and, and drove them out and said, you know, y'all done turn the temple of the Lord into a den of thieves. That, that, you know, when Jesus got mad, the really long time he showed some real aggression and anger. Well, uh, Jewish people called the temple and that courtyard, they called it the bazaar of the sons of Ananias. So he was the one that was profiting from the selling stuff that was going on in the temple. Now that, that led me to this. Now, a, a whole lot of things you can mess with, but don't mess with nobody's money. <laughs> you, you can do a lot of things. When you start messing with, that's the quickest way to get in trouble with somebody is to mess with their money. And so Jesus was messing with announce his money. He didn't care nothing about being called the Messiah. I don't care about none of that. But you messing with my pockets, okay, I'm in. Let's kill him and let's do it quickly. Whatever I got to say, whatever I got to do, I'll do it because Jesus done mess with my pockets. And, and ain't nobody going to come back. So he, my business is done. So we got to kill him. And so here's what Ananias said. Ananias was questioning Jesus. And not only did he want to know about Jesus, but he started asking about the other disciples. Ananias wanted to get everybody. So, okay, you messed up my money. All them other guys that was with you, they was around looking and laughing. I'm going to kill them too. I want everybody. And, but Jesus wouldn't answer him. And so, Ananias said, you better tell me something or we're going to put these things on you. So they beat Jesus. And so Jesus says this after they beat him. He says, now, if I'm guilty or if I did something wrong, you have to prove it. But if I'm speaking the truth, you got to let me go. See, Jesus was smart. He knew the customs and the law. So in other words, why in the world are you beating me and I'm speaking things that are true? So Ananias couldn't handle that. So he couldn't, he couldn't handle it. So what he did was he bound him up like a prisoner and he sent Jesus to his son-in-law who was now the high priest. Oh, it gets shady, I'm telling you, it's shady, it's flawed. So Ananias, the former high priest that didn't have no authority in the, Jewish, in the Jewish community was trying to convict Jesus and he had no power to do it. So why would you take somebody who's supposed to be a criminal to somebody who doesn't have any authority to pronounce judgment? It's flawed. But okay, since I can't get you, you want to answer my questions, I'll send you to somebody who does. So he sent him to Caiaphas, who was his son-in-law. And Caiaphas was a high priest at this time. Here's what you need to know about Caiaphas. Caiaphas said, now y'all know it's better that one person die rather than the whole nation be destroyed. And he said that. So he was already trying to figure out a way to kill Jesus. And then if you read back in chapter 26, we're going to be in Matthew chapter 27. But in chapter 26, some of the elders, be quiet, phone. Some of the elders 
Some of the high priests, they had all got together at Caiaphas' house and they were plotting a way to sneak in, get Jesus at night, and kill him before anybody realized it. So he was already wanting to kill Jesus because he knew what Jesus was really all about. It's one thing to want to kill Jesus because of money. It's another thing to want to kill Jesus because, well, everybody's following him now. Ain't nobody coming to me no more. I'm supposed to be the high priest. I'm supposed to be the man around town. I'm the big deal. Jesus ain't nobody. He was born in Nazareth. Does anything good come out of it? And so that was the kind of attitude that this guy had. And so he says, okay, I gotta, I'll kill him. So bring it to me. I'll, I'll pronounce him guilty. And so they take him to Caiaphas, the high priest, and he's going to pronounce him to die. And in chapter 26, uh, we just talked about this, the high priest, they were at his house. We are, I'm, I'm way ahead of myself. <laughs> So they're trying to figure out a way. What can we do to make sure that Jesus has to die? It's almost as if these educated religious men forgot about what was written in Isaiah. It's almost, that's how jealous and envious they was of Jesus because of the impact that he had on the town. It's almost like they forgot about what the old prophets wrote. And they said, now what can we do? The only thing that they could come up with is... Um, Blasphemy. They said, well, we're going to send him over to Pilate on the charge of he says he's God. Now, that might have worked 300 years or 500 years before when all of the children of Israel were real serious about blasphemy, when they was real serious about who claimed to be God and we've been waiting on the Messiah. And it was serious then. But now they were under the, the Roman Empire. Pilate didn't care nothing about no religious customs and traditions. He only cared about one thing. I'm in power. Get me my money. That's all he cared about. So they take him to Pilate on the charge of blasphemy. And, 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 you, and that's when we begin to get to chapter 27. And so, so they take him to Pilate. And Pilate is questioning and doing all these things. And he says, look, I've questioned this dude. In my eyes, he's done nothing wrong. So I don't find any reason to kill him. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to take him in the back and we're going to beat him up real good for you. We're going to you know, put these things on him and we're going to bloody him up, lump him up real nice for you. But we have no reason in the Roman government to kill Jesus. And then the elders and all the priests and all the scribes, of course, they begin to say, no, uh, not only uh, Pilate was he blaspheming, but he's starting a riot. He's talking about he's the real king and, and Caesar's not the real king and, and he messing with your money now, Pilate. Wait a minute. Okay, let me rethink this thing. So Pilate takes him back in there and he says, now, now Jesus, they trying to kill you. They want me to deliver you to death. Jesus didn't, wasn't really talking much. And he says, so I'm going to ask you one more time. Are you the king of the Jews? In other words, are you trying to usurp the authority of, of Caesar? Are you trying to move in of our territory and become a king who's going to try to dominate and do what only Caesar can do? And Jesus said, you say it. So Pilate said, man, you're making this thing hard on me. I don't know what I'm going to do. They really ain't got no charges against you. I don't find no fault in you. But they out there about to ride and, and tear up, you know, my part of town. I, I can't have that, so what can I do? So Pilate takes him back out. And then that's when we get to our verse. Matthew chapter 27. This is what Pilate say. He says, I didn't find no reason, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to wash my hands of this matter. And I'm going to let y'all deal with it. He said, I find no fault, no reason to put this man to death. But I'm washing literally. In other words, it, it ain't on me no more. It's on y'all. And then the text goes on to say that Pilate asked him, you know, okay, so in your custom it says, who do you want? Do you want Jesus or do you want 
Barabbas, the criminal. We talked about him before. Give us Barabbas, give us Barabbas. But what I want you to see was the second part of the verse. Pilate told him, I will not be guilty of this man's death. You are the ones who are causing it. All the people answered, we will be responsible. We accept for ourselves, not only us, and for our children, any punishment in this death. Now we started out with a flaw, a flawed arrest. Judas couldn't have been an eyewitness. Took him to Ananias, who was retired. He couldn't do nothing. Caiaphas, who was the high priest, he really couldn't do nothing. So it was flawed. But the biggest flaw of all was when the people said, we'll be responsible. We'll be responsible. In other words, we want to put this dude, and then most of these were a small group of the Pharisees and Sadducees. It wasn't, you know, because it's early in the morning. Most folks are still asleep. But they wanted Jesus dead so bad that they were willing to lie, create witnesses, false testimonies, and do all these things in a matter of five or six hours to put Jesus to death because they were tired of dealing with him. And their, their decision was flawed because they were so set on killing Jesus that they couldn't see that they were the ones that he was dying for. So many times in the world that we live in, people point their finger at Christ followers and talk about how much of a fanatic you are and you crazy for going to church and all of y'all end up with a bunch of hypocrites and, all, and, and they give all this long list of reasons of why they shouldn't be associated with the church or why Jesus should be put to death and we shouldn't celebrate him no more. Don't talk about him in schools. Don't talk about him in society. Don't do this. Don't do that. And it's all because they are living with the fall that they don't need a savior. That's what they were saying. We got to get rid of Jesus is because we don't need him. We're in charge. That's what the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the high priests were basically saying. They were flawed in their thinking, overlooking what the prophets had written, overlooking what, what, what the, the law of Moses had taught. And they were saying, listen, we don't like Jesus. We want him dead and we're going to kill him at all costs. Even if we got to come up with a bunch of charges that are false, even if we got to do it illegally, we want Jesus dead. Their thinking was flawed. And I think about my life growing up in church. I knew all the Sunday school stories. I knew all the songs to sing. I knew all the right words to say when my daddy would ask me a question on Sunday. Uh, after Sunday on church about the sermon. I knew what to say, but I spent most of my time in church sleep. <laughs> because my thinking was flawed. So many people don't think they need a savior because of flawed things. I'm good enough. I, I know the law of Moses. I'm good enough. I treat people good. I, I help out people whenever I can. I do all these things that are being put on my good account. Surely I'm good enough to go to heaven. All we go to the other stream is I'm so bad that there is nothing that Jesus can do for me. I have done some of the most crazy, outrageous. If you only knew what I've done, you would put me to death yourself. And it's flawed. All because they didn't understand what Jesus had came to do. And my heart is so heavy because I'm almost convinced that so many people in 2018 don't understand what Jesus came to do. Because of flawed thinking. Here's what Jesus came to do. This was the law of Moses. Thou shalt not bear false witness. Thou shalt not commit adultery. 
Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not cover. And the list goes on. There is no way that nobody in here can keep the Ten Commandments. Even at my best, I might get four right. <laughs> On my best day, all I am is a four out of ten that's still a failing grade. But here's the deal. Jesus said, if you're guilty of just one, that's right. then you're guilty of everything. That's right. Here's how it looked in my house. I thought about my chores as a kid. I had to feed the cows, feed the hogs, get the eggs out of the chicken coop, chop wood, you know, all the, get the weeds out of the garden. When my dad came home at the end of the day, if I did all of this stuff but miss one, I still had to face my punishment. If you keep it, well, Ron, I've never, I've never killed anybody. Have you ever told a lie? Have you ever wanted something that somebody else had? Have you ever stolen anything? I've done all three of those. And I said this before, by my own admission, I'm a lying thief who wants your stuff. <laughs> so I would be flawed in my thinking to, to say I don't need a savior. I've already broke just three of the commandments. And the longer you live, the longer you realize is that you can't keep the law. If we all had to be judged according to the law, shut the doors, turn out the lights, stop giving an offering, stop having a uh, 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 sacrament, don't have no more Lord's Supper, don't preach no more sermons, don't sing no more praise songs, don't put your Sunday best on, let's just burn everything down if we have to live according to the law. That was the thinking of the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and the high priest. We keep the law. And because we keep the law, we don't need you, Jesus. So if we got to lie, which breaks the law. If we got to co covet, which breaks the law. If we got to kill, which breaks the law, you got to go. Can you see the flaw in their thinking? But I told you, thank God for Friday's flaws, because if it hadn't been for the flaws that put Jesus on the cross, we would still be living under the law and not under grace. And according to the law, we got to keep 497 other rules all week long. We would be so busy trying to keep the law that we would have no time to live. And when they said, we'll take responsibility for killing Jesus. Now, I'm not going to take responsibility for my own sins. I'm not going to take responsibility for me lying. But I'll take responsibility for killing this joker. You got to be really flawed in your thinking. So that's the reason I say, thank God for the flaws. If I would have known that those shirts were messed up and had no neck and was too short, <laughs> I never would have bought them. Here's, here's, the, here's the moral of the story from what I saw. If the Pharisees and Sadducees would have known that Satan was behind the whole deal, they would have never put up a fight. The flaw is not that they were willing to kill Jesus. The flaw was believing the lies of Satan. The reason so many people today don't think they need a savior is because they believe the lies of Satan. The Bible says it this way. He's the father of lies. In other words, every lie that's ever been told, he's the author. All Satan knows how to do is lie. He don't know how to tell the truth. All he does is lie. And the flaw is believing that he wants what's good for the people. 
So thank God for flaws. It was my flaw. My sins was the reason that Jesus was arrested. And then you know the story goes on to say that they took Barabbas and then they took Jesus put a crown of thorns on his head put a big cross on his back drove him up the hill Golgotha place of the skull and they crucified him all because people believed the wrong thing flawed thinking put Jesus on the cross but there was another plan that had been orchestrated from the foundation of the world and this plan said you know Julie's gonna mess up Ronald's gonna mess up JD's gonna mess up yep. Tammy's gonna fall short Pete Tink Hagen everybody who's ever named the name of Christ they need a savior so we're going to use their own flawed thinking against them to get you to the cross and we're going to pay for their sins we're going to set them free from what's holding them captive their own flawed thinking so the rest of the story says they crucified Jesus and he laid his head on the locks of his shoulders said it's finished and he died that would be a great way to end the story of Jesus if, if we were Pharisees and high priests but that's just the beginning Hallelujah. That's only the beginning. So the reason why we celebrate every Sunday is because people wanted Jesus dead. But God wanted you to live. So as we get ready for next week, all week long, we're going to have the opportunity to communicate with flawed people. And you don't have to come to church here. But my goal is for us to encourage everyone that we know to go share in the celebration of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Amen. We have a chance, y'all, to have eternal impact on people's lives. And for me, that was scary. One reason I never wanted to be a pastor, personal testimony, I'll be done. I never wanted to have somebody else's eternity in my hands. But here's what God says. I didn't save you just for you. I saved you and I called you out of the darkness into the marvelous light for you to get the light and go shining in the dark. We have a tremendous opportunity with people who are going to go to church somewhere anyway. They don't have to come here. I hope they do. But we need to encourage everybody that we know in our lives that doesn't have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ to go and celebrate. Because God wants to do something in their lives. He wants to correct flawed thinking. My thinking is still flawed in a lot of areas, but not when it comes to Jesus. I know he's the Savior. I know he's the only way. <clears throat> I heard a guy say it like this, and we'll be done. I'm just rambling now. I'm, I'm bubbly inside. I'm sorry. But he says, if the smartest guy came into this church today with the best evidence that Jesus did not live, did not die. It's all fake. We've been bamboozled for the last 2,000 years. I would say, man, that was a great presentation. And I would leave here unshaken because I know for a fact 
that I'm different because Jesus died. Don't you want somebody else to experience the same thing? That's the opportunity that we have is to share the life changing power of what Jesus Christ did on the cross. So my prayer is that all of us will take time and be prayerfully thinking about who we can communicate that because of Friday, we get to enjoy Sunday morning. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word.